United States President Joe Biden, after meeting with the French President Emmanuel Macron at the White House, told reporters that he wants talks with the Russian President Vladimir Putin on certain conditions. One of those conditions is the annexation of some parts of Ukraine. Mr. Biden and the West recognize those as illegal and that Mr. Putin do away with them. However, Mr. Putin, on the other hand, told reporters that in order for negotiations to take place, the West and the U.S. must recognize the areas that have been negotiated and annexed. We believe that the talks for peace and negotiations won't take place unless there is some compromise. We start with the war in Ukraine, where the Kremlin has dismissed comments by President Biden that he would be prepared to talk to Vladimir Putin if the Russian leader signaled that he was looking to end the war in Ukraine. Mr. Biden insisted such talks could only take place after Russian troops withdrew. This comes as a senior Ukrainian official has said up to 13,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed since the start of Russia's invasion. Meanwhile, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz talked on the phone to Vladimir Putin this morning. The call focused exclusively on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Jessica Parker now reports from Kiev. Just outside Kiev, signs of remembrance. In this area, Russia's accused of killing hundreds of civilians during its occupation earlier this year. Moscow's denied targeting civilians. At Irpin Bridge, the Church of England's most senior cleric came to see the destruction for himself and had a robust message for President Putin. There will be no peace till we stop lying. You've got to tell the truth. However painful, there can never be a way forward built on lies. Meanwhile, in the south and east, the fighting goes on. Ukraine now taking the rare step in giving a number of how many troops have died. It says up to 13,000, but this can't be verified by the BBC. The truth is we don't know how many people have died during this conflict. What is certain is that this war continues to cost lives and cause tragedy. Meanwhile, Russia's repeated efforts to target Ukraine's energy grid means daily life is also being affected far away from the front line. Across Ukraine, the cold is starting to bite. In this bakery, they suddenly have a blackout, forced to do business in the dark. The situation in Ukraine is very difficult, says Ludmilla. They work with or without light. But if there's no power, they can't bake. So sometimes it means they can't work at all. Generators are popping up all over Kyiv as Russia's accused of trying to freeze Ukraine into submission. Lubov says she's stocked up on candles, water and food. The prospect of further power outages brings fear, but also defiance. Of course, we are afraid. We are very afraid of the difficulties that may come this winter. But we agree to get through those difficulties together. The main thing is that Russia does not win. Lubov is just one life among millions touched by this war. Everyone walking their own road. But something you often hear is that steady determination to carry on. Jessica Parker, BBC News in Kiev. Well, I'm joined now by Oliver Moody, the Berlin correspondent for the Times newspaper. Thanks very much for talking to us. We were just looking there at the situation in Kiev. Tell us about the view from Germany. You're in Berlin. We've heard that Olaf Scholz had a call uh, with the Kremlin. Tell us about that. Good afternoon. Um, the, according to the German readout of the telephone conversation, Scholz um, condemned the missile bombardment of Kyiv and other cities and also urged Putin, as Biden has recently, to reach a diplomatic solution that would involve the withdrawal of Russian troops from Ukraine. The Kremlin side of the conversation suggests that none of those messages cut through in any way, shape or form. They said that um, Putin had been, said Russia had been provoked into launching the missile attacks on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. Um, and called for an urgent investigation into the bombing of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines. 
And after nine months of war now in Ukraine, there is concern about dimin diminishing ammunition stocks um, in Europe. But this situation is particularly acute in Germany. Yes, it's quite right to frame it as a Europe-wide problem. One way to look at it is to look at the way NATO has asked its members to ensure that they have enough ammunition in stock for at least 30 days of high-intensity fighting. And the European states are on a spectrum. If you look at the Baltics, they've taken the possibility of a Russian ground invasion very seriously for the past years. And Estonia, for example, has invested 40% of its entire military procurement budget into ammunition, so they're pretty well prepared. Somewhere in the middle, you have um, Britain and France, the two largest NATO militaries in Europe. And there are credible official estimates that they each have enough for about two weeks. And then towards the bottom end, you have Germany, where there are sort of pretty credible analyst reports that it would run out of some kinds of ammunition within a matter of hours. It would effectively be no longer able to fight within, after two days. How big of a concern is that for Germany? It's an enormous concern. And the distinctive thing in Germany is that this has been known about for a very long time, um, since at least as far back as procurement reforms in 2011. And just to illustrate the scale of the problem, it's estimated that Germany will need to spend about uh, 20 billion euros or more on ammunition. And so far, there's a lot of bemusement among the German defense industry sources I've been speaking to about why the government has yet to really start investing that money right now when we need to generate production capacity to get back into a situation where there are adequate ammunition stocks. And solving this problem is, is not very simple, is it? It's, it's not just about ordering uh, the arms from a factory, as it were. As that situation develops, does that make peace talks even more compelling for all sides? I think there is certainly a question about whether European NATO members will be able to sustain the level of military aid that they have been putting into Ukraine, having already transferred or at least pledged more than 10 billion euros worth of munitions at the same time as they're now having to very seriously consider their own defence posture and whether they're really prepared for the possibility of a land war. However, I think the political commitment to supporting Ukraine from Germany, from Poland, from the Baltic states, from virtually all of the European allies remains tremendously strong. They are committed to this and it would take a substantial deterioration of the situation before there would be any kind of pressure on the Ukrainians from the European side to seek a peace deal. All right. Uh, we really appreciate getting your thoughts. Oliver Moody, uh, Berlin correspondent for The Times, thank you for your time today.